Good morning, good morning, good morning. Ah, oh, the lovely lady in the post shop. She's, she's forgotten I asked her if she had a good Mother's Day on her day. I found out her mother had died and she had no children. <coughs> Faux pas has been forgiven. Look at the lovely lighting. For the purposes of the video, it's a very wet day. All that water that went up, tilly up, top, had to come down, tilly down, down. So it's been raining all night. But I've got a bit of a barbecue coming up, so I've just put a marquee up. <coughs> and I went out last night and checked it, and I'm pleased to say it's completely watertight. So if you're coming to my barbecue and it rains, we're okay. How are you anyway? All right. I had quite a good day yesterday on the basis. My hair's a bit Kim Jong Un, isn't it, today? It's because I haven't got my second pair of glasses on. <coughs> so, what's up? What's up? I uh, got an email yesterday from Langen Burson, who are a company that. Uh, does the sort of industry standard private benchmarking report on dentistry for all these rich bankers and venture capitalists who want to know what's going on in various markets Lang and Burson reports on the dental market they're not a dental company as such but they do have uh, researchers who are sort of over the years have done a lot of research into the dental market and they like to have the, um, when they write to people uh, for the uh, information, they like to have, um, to be able to say that they're doing it, you know, with the knowledge of and the sort of tacit support of one or other of the dental associations that, you know, that your, your trade association is, you know, supports us in asking for this information because it puts the response rate up. So... Every couple of years they ring us up and say, is it okay if we use your name? Again, I don't know why they use our name. I mean, I mean, it's the name, but I mean, I assume that they use our name because the British Dental Association has told them to take a long walk on a short pier and said, as they always do, you know, appreciate. <laughs> do you want to do anything positive? No, no, that's our job. So they probably said, no, you can't use, uh, say that it's on behalf of the BDA. But we're quite happy for them to <clears throat> say that they're doing it uh, in cooperation with us. The report itself is fantastic and the, what's even more fantastic is that they send us a free copy because they charge about 600 quid for it in, in uh, consideration of the, uh, you know, of the fact that they um, use our name, they just give us a free copy of the report and, uh, so, and it's tremendously helpful. It really is the only sort of uh, unbiased uh, and I'd say reasonably balanced uh, report on the dental sector and they do it every few years I think it'll be three or four years or something so if you are contacted for information about the dental market by Lang and Burson uh, we haven't given them the membership list or anything so it's no you're not more likely to be contacted than anyone else but just in case you are it's a genuine survey it's very good it's a very useful survey and we do get a copy so it benefits the association if you're asked to cooperate, if you cooperate, so just thought I'd let you know. The, um, the other thing that uh, sort of came up in the news indirectly was the new contract and the new sort of NHS dental contract in England as we have to call it now because everyone's got a different contract. Um, and <clears throat> that that is sort of as, you know that really came up because of the, it was debated at the local dental committee conference and uh, sort of quite uh, keen to push things forward you know I mean for all the years and years and years of nothing happening to which I'll come back to later uh, they want to sort of shift things forward so you can't blame people because they're stuck in this stupid Goldilocks system where you get you know you either get daddy bears porridge, mummy bears porridge, or the baby bears porridge, depending on how much work you've done. And uh, they, they sort of seem to be divided into those people who are like, come on, you know, this is about time. You're negligent in not bringing a contract out. And other people who are still 
apparently unlimited patience and, and say to the government, you know, well, we'd rather you took your time and got all the problems sorted out and brought out a brilliant contract. Why do they think the government's going to bring out a brilliant contract? I don't know. But, you know, you know, take you take your time and, and iron out all the wrinkles before you, you suggest it because we want it to be brilliant. The one we've got is crap and we want the next one to be brilliant. The last three we had were crap. So I don't know why they think the next one's going to be brilliant. But anyway. <laughs> so, um, but... Um, you know, it's no... I think Eddie, what's his face, writing in the dentist, said, you know, we'd rather have... We'd rather wait than, than have a contract that doesn't work. Because if we have a contract that doesn't work or no contract, then we'll end up... We'll just stick with UDAs. We'll end up with UDAs. And we all agree UDAs are bad. Although, you know, nobody seemed to agree that UDAs were bad before they were brought in. I mean, the, the DPA, I think, was pretty well a lone voice in saying that the UDAs were going to be a disaster before they came in. But now, of course, everybody knows that UDAs are a disaster. And uh, you know, the fact of the matter is that the, 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 the last chief dental officer, Barry Cockcroft, who was the sort of the champion of the, of the UDA system, and then uh, realised because he was uh, he was he was brilliant at sort of saving his skin, <laughs> pulling the fat out of the fire. Uh, decided that just before he left, that uh, he was going to have to concede that a new contract was necessary, and not that his contract was a bad contract, but just that a new one would be better. And um, left uh, Sarah Hurley or Sarah Hurley or whatever her name is, who's still quivering under her desk, to uh, introduce the new one, and. What he knew, and what she she would have known if she had worked in general practice at all, or followed anything at all closely, was that there, there are two major hurdles with this new contract. And they were known about right from the beginning, okay? So, this thing is like, <laughs> it's like, it's like Fermat's last theorem. Or, or Fermat's last postulate, as it should be called, because he didn't actually turn it into a theorem. This is Cockcroft's last postulate, which is that a new contract will be possible along the lines that he laid out. And they are hopelessly optimistic and completely unworkable. And it's a bit like, um, oh, how can I put it? Well, look, look, let me just tell you what the two things are and then, you know, you can decide for yourself whether they're hopelessly unworkable. But the, the one is um, the patient's charges. Patient's charges is always the thing that brings down any contract because the Treasury will veto anything that doesn't give them the same or more money. And the patient's charges under the new contract are, are all over the place. There's no... There's no uh, guarantee that anything like the same that nobody really knows how much patient's charge is going to be generated and so there's no guarantee that there's going to be continuity in terms of uh, government revenue for patient's charges and the mere um, how can I put it the mere way that it's structured the idea that it's supposed to be preventive and that charges are you know patients are charged the more work they have done means that any prevention is going to reduce patients' charges. And so that's, it is by its very nature, uh, contradictory. <laughs> this is an internal tension, an internal stress that is going to bring the whole thing down. Um, and then the other thing is just waiting lists. And, you know, it's all very well saying that we want you to see patients and uh, do this and do that and do the other and do a six point check on every tooth and uh, do uh, you know give them a nice little uh, folder to take away that tells them all about the state of their mouth and what they can do to improve it and and sort of follow them up and do the plaque control and stuff like that that sort of stuff is possible with a shared savings approach but it's not possible under the way that they're proposing to structure the contract and the uh, pilots of course have demonstrated this pilots are <laughs> the many, the many pilots, the many 
the hundreds of dentists that have been working on the dozens of pilots that they have tried uh, have demonstrated that uh, waiting lists are going to go out of control. It's all right to have a couple of hundred dentists working on a pilot and explain waiting lists for that that cohort of dentists. <laughs> but to, to press the big red button to roll that system out nationally or, or across England is something that no chief dental officer is going to ever, they're never going to press it. Because the the minute they do, they're going to have, it's going to be Scarborough all over again. We're going to have, the press is going to be full of stories about patients who can't get in seeing NHS dentists because they are too busy coping with the five patients they had in the first week. <laughs> so, you know, what? <clears throat> so it's been reduced almost to trial and error. You know, they're almost like, they keep trying different pilots in the hope that one of them will will suddenly, they'll, they'll find one by random that works. They'll, start, they'll just change a parameter and they'll oh my God, you know, all of a sudden the dental Higgs boson is discovered and the thing that will give everything, you know, these proposals some sort of gravity <laughs> in both senses of the word and not, uh, you know, but they're not. These things are not put together by pragmatists, they're put together by dreamers. They're like all the windmills off the coast of Whitstable. You know, when I look at those windmills, I don't see wind power. I, I see all the coal and gas that went into making the steel that makes them. <laughs> and I see, I see all the uh, nuclear generated and coal and gas powered electricity that went into extracting the rubber and, uh, and, and refining the copper that made the cables that brings the, the little bit of wind power brought ashore. And you don't, you know, you can't, <clears throat> it's, you might say, oh, well, Derek, you know, you're a bit of a, you know, a bit of a heretic there, you know, you, you should be all in with wind and power and stuff like that, rain and uh, tidal power and stuff like that, because eventually, eventually there'll be so many windmills that we'll be completely windmilled up and then the windmills will make warm windmills. You're dreaming. Then we're never going to get to that. Never. We're never going to get to that. Never, never, never. Okay, never. If you think we are, then you need to look into it. We are never going to get to that. This, these renewables are only going to be, uh, only ever going to be a small part of our energy uh, requirements. But anyway, what else? What else? <clears throat> Charlie Gard, I think, is, is a tragic, tragic, tragic case of a young boy who is, as far as I can tell, brain dead, or as near as, and, but has, where, but the parents and his various supporters genuinely believe that there is a one in a million chance he may be cured by some, some treatment in America. And Again, as far as I understand it, and I may be wrong, he is, he's been made a ward of court, and the court's decision is whether or not it's in his best interest to be kept alive in this sort of vegetative state, while his parents argue about this sort of semi-mythical attempt, approach, that might, might well just give him some quality of life. And if I've got that completely wrong, then, then I do apologise, but the way this is being spun in America is completely different. In America, they have a thing, this, the word socialist is the same as the word communist over there, and socialism is, uh, is a dirty word over there amongst the, the sort of the capitalist clique, you know, the, uh, the sort of the... Uh, the establishment capitalists who have got things like healthcare sewn up, uh, and which is why American healthcare is so sort of ridiculously expensive because it's effectively a private monopoly in the in the states. And what they're doing is they're selling the Charlie Guard story as the story of a young boy who is effectively in prison by the NHS. He's been he's in prison. He's in a socialist hospital prison that has decreed that uh, he should die 
in a socialist hospital rather than receive treatment in the private sector. And that's exactly how it's being sold. They, I don't think they realise that he's not actually being, his interests are not being looked after by their so-called socialist health system. They're being looked after by the High Court. And in, so in fact he's in the care of the judicial system. Uh, of which they actually, if they knew that in America, they might have a slightly different slant on the story because they do have at least some respect for the Supreme Court. But, you know, that's it, it just goes to show how things are sold, isn't it? How, how uh, there's a battle really going on in health for idea between the sort of the uh, free market advocates like perhaps myself in dentistry and... Um, and the more social medicine advocates who are trying to keep the health service going even though they're, they're trying to make two and two add up into five and that was the problem I mean the, the problem Cock <laughs> with the Cockroft had with his new new contract you know not the UDA the one that he was inventing to 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 sort of stall the criticism of of the UDA system that he'd created he said don't worry guys I'm working on a new one <laughs> don't worry about uh, you know the uh, don't worry about the last cock up I'm working on an even bigger cluster and <clears throat> what he did was he solved all the easy problems so he said uh, what size should the letters be what uh, you know what font what typeface what colour <laughs> Should we have the NHS logo on everything or not? You know, um, and then <clears throat> the the really really big intractable problems that probably can't be solved. The uh, patients charge revenue and the uh, waiting lists. He was like, well, okay, well, yeah, 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 they're complicated. I agree. Uh, let's just put them on the back burner for the moment. Let's concentrate on what we can solve. Let's concentrate on what we can do. Okay, don't be so negative. Don't keep pointing out what we can't do. Just let's, let's concentrate on building it, the system, until we're like 90% of the way there. And then and then we'll solve the patient's charge and the waiting list problems. Just trust me, guys, okay? Oh, by the way, I'm resigning. <laughs> I'm going to take a fat, fat sinecure with my dentist. Uh, so uh, I won't be here next week. Uh, there's this new girl coming in, Sarah uh, Burley Hurley or something. And anyway, she knows nothing about general practice, but... Um, it's been nice working with you. Cheerio. <laughs> so, so don't expect a new contract anytime soon. That's all I'm saying. Because they can't... What they're doing, this thing, this, this, this dichotomy between the people who are um, saying, you know, give them a bit longer, and then the people who are saying, no, they've had long enough, they're not going to do it. I think it's people finally waking up to the fact that they might not be going to do it. You know, it's all very well saying, oh, well, you know, it's been a long time. Um, oh, Led Zeppelin song, very good one as well. Um, you know, you say, well, they, they've had a long time to do this. And uh, and then to which they're you know, the response was, well, it takes a long time. These things are slow. They move glacial pace. You know, you have to give them, give them plenty of time and everything and make sure they get it right. We don't want them to get it wrong. And I think a few people are waking up to the fact that that really is the... Uh, it's not about the ends, it's about the means. This is what government is all about, the means, not about the ends. You, you try and ignore the ends. You try not to come to the ends, if you can. <laughs> Coming to the ends means that you're out of job, you know, that you've got, you don't have a responsibility. Your, your empire building is, is coming to a close and that can't be allowed to happen in the civil service. So it's all about the means and if the ends don't suit, then you just say, well, I'm working on some more means. And this, this new contract never was about uh, the new contract. That's the trouble. It wasn't ever about what we were going to arrive at because we were never intended to arrive. We were all in, we was always intended just to be in transit because if a civil servant like the chief dental officer gets an angry MP or a select committee come up to him and say, listen here, Cockroft, my constituents are writing to me. I don't like it when they write to me. If they write to me, it means they're unhappy. If they're unhappy, it means that they're not going to vote for me. And if they don't vote for me, I'm not going to be an MP and get to shag all these young researchers. So that makes me very unhappy. So what are you doing about it? 
And Cockroft, of course, his reply was always, I am, don't you worry, Minister, I am doing, keep them researchers coming. I am doing something about it. I am working on it, so I am working on it. Working it, shaking that bush, boss. Shaking that bush. <laughs> <laughs> so, they don't, they won't, <laughs> ever, it will never come to a conclusion. And the answer certainly won't be 42. Well, it might be, it might be 42 years before they finish. Oh, oh dear. Tomorrow, <clears throat> now I'm going to trail tomorrow's show. Tomorrow I'm going to talk to you about sugar-free gum. And in particular, Wrigley's. And in particular, Wrigley's effect on on dental research. Well, you can probably guess what it's going to be, can't you? However, if Wrigley's is listening and they do decide to offer me a trip to the Caribbean to discuss the effects of sugar-free gum on dentistry, I'll be more than happy to hear from them. And if they contact me, I'll let you know. All right, I might even get you a ticket. That'd be good, wouldn't it? All right, <laughs> see you tomorrow. Bye.